Today, Peter Levy is here. He got his uh, bachelor's and master's degree here at BCT. And I think, I'm not certain, but I think that it was here that Peter had his first exposure to energy modeling. If not, we'll take credit for it anyways. And uh, so that uh, uh, Peter began, shortly after his uh, academic career, began working as a sustainable design consultant that specialized in energy model modeling for a company named Green Engineer, Engineers in Concord, Mass. So in addition to his academic <coughs> credentials, Peter is a certified building energy model professional. He's a lead AP and a sort of passive house consultant. During his tenure at Green Engineers, where he's now a principal of an employee-owned company, Mr. Levy has worked on dozens of energy models for purposes of lead certification, code compliance, utility incentives, and quantification of sustainable design uh, programs and systems. So please welcome Mr. Levy for our lecture today. Thank you, Carl. Um, so yeah, actually, I had never heard of energy modeling until I took Carl's course uh, in 2012. So that uh, drastically changed the uh, trajectory of my life, I guess, because I wouldn't have my current job without it. So thank you, Carl. Um, so yeah, as, as he said, I'm a graduate of the BCT undergrad and uh, Master's of Green Building programs. And so since graduating from the uh, Master's program, I've been working at the Green Engineer for almost six years now. And yeah, doing energy models, uh, daylight models, and some uh, life cycle analysis modeling for the last five years. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So yeah, the uh, talking about is the role of energy modeling in building design and construction. So how this how this plays out in the professional setting. All right. So the objectives we're all covered today are: what is energy modeling? What information goes into a model? Uh, what information comes out of a model? How are models used to inform designs? What other purposes do models serve? And uh, how is daylight modeling used, which is a separate type of model, but often, often interacts with your energy model. So it's worth talking about a little bit for today's purposes. So first question is, what is an energy model? So there's generally uh, sort of four fields that fall under the general umbrella of energy modeling. So you've got your whole building energy simulation, which is uh, what I'm primarily going to talk about today. You've got your daylight analysis. Uh, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end. And then you also, people tend to throw in solar PV analysis, um, which looks at obviously PV systems and life cycle analysis. Uh, and for those who aren't familiar with life cycle analysis, it looks at the embodied energy that goes into the materials that um, go into a building. So the others look at your operational energy use of a building or the energy production of a PV system. LCA, LCA analysis looks at your uh, embodied energy. So what is a uh, energy model in terms of whole building energy simulation? So it's a computational model where you look at your envelope, your mechanical systems, your internal loads, your occupancy patterns, and the local weather to your project in order to predict the annual operational energy use of your building. So the general process is you have to uh, you have to get your hands on all of the architectural information, the you know your your uh, your wall, roof, wall, uh, window assemblies, your sort of uh, air sealing methodology, and subsequent infiltration rates, and your mechanical drawings, your mechanical schedules, all the HVAC equipment that goes into your building. Uh, then your your you've got a sort of a zoning guide. Can people see this laser here. Not great, but we've got. Uh, <coughs> Like your thermal zoning, so you know what rooms are served by what HVAC systems, uh, that sort of information. We've also got the internal loads of a building, so your your lighting loads, your equipment loads, plug loads, and then lastly your occupancy pattern for a building. So like this room was empty 20 minutes ago, now there's 75 people in it. So you need to sort of know when when uh, different parts of your building are going to be used at different capacities to accurate, accurately predict uh, energy use. So you gather all that information together. And then you input it into your energy modeling software. So that usually takes uh, somewhere between two to four weeks of just hard, um, hard coding information into your software. Tends to be a lot of back and forth with your architects and your mechanical engineers 
Um, usually there's some information missing from your initial drawings. You get so a lot of a lot of back and forth, a bit of an iterative, iterative process um, of figuring out what you're missing and adding it. So the softwares I typically use, uh, most of the time I use eQuest, um, use Design Builder a fair amount, and we're starting to use Open Studio uh, a bit more as, as we learn it more and more. <laughs> So once you've put all that information into your, into your model, the question is what comes out? Why, why are you doing this? What comes out is your operational energy use of your building. So typically that means the uh, annual kilowatt hours the building uses, the annual therms of gas the building uses, um, or for something like UMass that has a central plant, uh, your annual steam that the building uses, or chilled water or hot water that the building uses. So. This comes out in a grand total of your total kilowatt hours the building uses, your total therms the building uses, uh, but then it also comes out in, uh, as you can see in this table here, your, your annual energy use per end use. So the amount of kilowatt hours per year that your lights use in the building, or the amount of kilowatt hours your cooling system uses in the building. Um, also your fans, your pumps, your heat rejection, anything that uses electricity in the building, you can break that out and say, how much electricity is this one thing using? Uh, then the same thing for gas. How many therms uh, does the building use for heating versus how many therms is it using for domestic hot water? And then you can drill even further into that information and say, okay, for um, you can look at an hourly basis throughout the whole year, uh, 8760, at any given hour, how much energy is the lights, are the lights using or how much energy is the cooling system using heating system? Um, so the hourly information isn't usually that useful for presenting to clients. Um, no one really cares that much about one hour. But it's actually an incredibly useful tool when you're doing quality control on a model and you want to make sure that everything makes sense. Uh, if, for instance, you're, you're, you thought your lighting energy use was too high, you could drill into your hourly data and say, okay, um, at four in the morning, <laughs> is there any lighting energy use in the building? And if you see that there's just as much lighting energy use at four in the morning as there was at uh, two in the afternoon, you could say that doesn't make sense. The building's not occupied at four in the morning. Clearly, I screwed something up with the scheduling, or there's some control that's that's uh, screwed up in the model. So usually, the process is after we've stimulated the model, we look at the hourly data, uh, make sure that there's no, no outlying information that doesn't make sense in there. So that's great. You can get all this information out of the model down to you know every end use for every hour. So the question is. What, why do you need that information? Who is it useful to and why? So there's really two, two reasons, uh, or two broad categories of reasons why uh, energy models are useful. You can use a model to inform your design, or you can use a model to validate your design. So when you're using a model to inform your design, what we're typically doing is we're looking at uh, design alternatives, usually for the purpose of uh, reducing energy use. We typically call these energy conservation measures, or ECMs. You'll hear me say that phrase a lot. Uh, today. So we're, we're usually looking at ECMs for the purpose of looking at how much energy, uh, operational energy use they reduce. We then also usually get um, from cost estimators the incremental cost of adding that ECM. So like how much, how much more expensive is your condensing boiler versus your traditional boiler. So we then can look at, um, we can look at how much annual operational energy use an ECM saves, then compare that with the incremental cost of implementing that ECM and then we can generate a pretty simple uh, payback analysis that says, okay, it's going to take five years for this ECM to pay back. That's probably worth doing. Or we might find it takes 200 years for that ECM to pay back, and it's probably not worth doing. So that's really how we use a model to inform the design, is to let the owner, the architect, the engineers make better, more educated decisions um, and figure out how to best allocate their money for energy efficiency. So the other side of things, we've got uh, models that validate the design. So when I say validate the design, I mean... Um, somebody out there needs you to prove that your building is going to use some amount of energy less than a baseline version of that building. Uh, that can be, so typically that can be for either, uh, that can either be required or that can be elective. Um, and I'll go into a lot more detail on these in a little bit, but generally speaking, required validation is uh, for things like code compliance or MEPA compliance, <laughs> which is a uh, Massachusetts zoning uh, compliance issue for certain projects. Then things like MSBA or Massachusetts School Building Authority, um, they give money to uh, help towns build schools, but one of their requirements is you have to 
uh, schools have to meet a certain threshold of energy efficiency, and you need to use a model to prove that. Uh, there's also a lot of towns we find have their own individual energy efficiency requirements. They'll, they'll typically say that they want their building to have an EUI below uh, 30 or something. So we'll use an energy model to predict that and say, yes, uh, yes or no, this design is or is not meeting that requirement. Uh, so then we have elective validation. So that is usually done for either certification programs like LEED or Passive House or uh, CHIPS, which is the um, collabor collaboration for high-performance schools, which is uh, specific to schools. Uh, and then we have the utility incentive programs, so things like Mass Save in Massachusetts or P4P &P in New Jersey or uh, NYSERDA in New York. And a lot of times we get hired to do a model for all of those reasons. Um, in fact, that's, that's usually the case. So I'll talk a little bit about a case study of a residential tower I've been working on in Boston um, that pretty much hired us to do a model for all of those reasons. Um, and we've done a whole lot of modeling on this one. I uh, started working on it in 2014, which seems crazy to me, but I've been working on this project for five years. Um, we, the, first, the first analysis we did was in SD and DD and even a little bit actually in CD. We did design assistance modeling where we looked at a whole host of energy conservation measures to help the team make better decisions about what things to include in the project. Uh, we then did utility incentive models for the project that we did through DDs and CDs. Um, and lastly, we did code compliance models at the end of 100% CDs and a lead model at the end of 100% um, CDs. That's actually the last thing we're wrapping up right now. So I'll talk a little bit more about each of those uh, reasons to, to do a model now. So first is modeling to inform the design. So again, we, we model to inform the design so that we can make better decisions about what ECMs make sense to include. Um, we look at ECMs, we figure out how much annual operational energy use they're gonna save. We then look at the incremental cost of including them, do a payback analysis and say, some ECMs make sense, some ECMs don't make sense. It's our recommendation that you pursue the ones that make sense. So the, um, ECMs we typically look at, uh, this is somewhat of an abbreviated list, but the most common ones we look at are uh, envelope ECMs, which would be things like your wall, and, your wall assemblies, your roof assemblies, floor assemblies, different types of windows and different, uh, you know, different variables in the windows like your U-value, your solar heat gain coefficient, or even your visible light transmission, transmittance. Um, and then things like air sealing and subsequent infiltration rates of the building. We also look a lot at uh, HVAC ECMs. So this would be looking at different system types, so comparing constant volume systems to variable air volume systems, or uh, looking at things like chilled beams or fan coil units or you know any, any uh, HVAC system you can think of. We can pretty much model and look at how they, how they compare to one another. We can also look at just within uh, HVAC system types, unit efficiencies. So we can compare 98% efficient condensing boilers to traditional 80% gas boilers or uh, super efficient chillers to code compliant chillers um, or any, any other equipment that has an effic efficiency associated with it. We also often look at energy recovery ventilation. Uh, that's typically required by code now, but um, we can look at more efficient energy recovery ventilation. We also look at things like demand control ventilation uh, or fuel switching. When I say fuel switching, switching, I mean uh, going from using natural gas as your uh, source of heating to an all-electric option like a heat pumps or VRF or something. So you're switching from gas to all-electric. And you can see how that impacts uh, energy use. Then we also look a lot at uh, internal loads, so lighting power density, and then things like uh, daylighting controls or occupancy controls that uh, control either the lighting or uh, plug loads to uh, get rid of things like phantom loads during unoccupied periods. We also look a lot at uh, occupancy patterns and set point controls. Uh, and those aren't really inherent to the uh, design of the building. They're more, they're more on the operational side of a building but the model is a good opportunity to uh, see the impacts of, of changing those things, and we can then pass that information on to the owner. They can pass that information on to the uh, uh, facility manager who can then control the building uh, with that knowledge. 
So that would be something like uh, looking at the difference between an unoccupied setback temperature of like 58 degrees uh, versus dropping that down to like 55 or 53 degrees. And we can say if you do that, you'll actually save a whole bunch of energy. Um, pass that information on to your facility manager and, and implement that. So for this, uh, this RESI project in Boston, I'll talk a little bit about a few of the uh, sets of ECMs that we looked at uh, that were most interesting. So this one was, uh, we looked at a whole bunch of envelope ECMs for the project, but this specifically was looking at uh, uh, windows. So we looked at different solar heat gain coefficients and different U values for the windows. Hopefully you're gonna be able to see this laser. Um, so, We've got the we've got this table of results here where we've got the energy by end use in each column. So we've got the lights, the plug loads, heating, cooling, heat injection, pumps, fans, um, domestic hot water, and then we've got uh, total cost and the percent cost savings relative to the baseline. So I'll talk a lot more about the baseline uh, when I get to the lead and uh, validation modeling, but baseline was basically just a code compliant version of the building. So in each uh, row here, we have, we've got the baseline, we've got the proposed design, which was the design before we did any uh, ECMs to it. And we've got low solar heat gain coefficient on the southeast and southwest facades, low solar heat gain coefficient on all facades, and then lastly, we've got the uh, argon-filled windows, which had the lower U value. So I really like this, um, I really like this study because it really, it was the perfect use of an energy model in that we sort of went in with some assumptions of um, what we thought the results of the ECMs would be, and the model proved us largely wrong and actually significantly changed um, what windows the project selected. So. Might be a little hard to see the numbers here, so you might have to take my word for it. But uh, by putting the low solar heat gain coefficient on all of the windows, we re uh, the project reduced the total operational energy cost. And when I say operational energy cost, I basically mean the utility cost that the project would pay. So whatever the cost of gas is, the cost of electricity is, uh, multiply that by the operational energy use, and that's the energy cost. Uh, so by going from the basis of design windows to the low solar heat gain coefficient on all windows, the annual operational energy cost dropped by $30,000. So just putting, uh, having low solar heat gain coefficient windows is going to save them $30,000 every year. And reducing the solar heat gain coefficient on windows is a pretty inexpensive uh, alternative. It's... Um, so that, I suspect that one, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think that was going to pay back in a couple of years, but pretty much nothing over the life of the building. Um, so that was actually a bit of a surprise to um, all of us. I mean, we knew it would make a bit of an impact, but that was uh, a bit bigger than we thought. What we thought was going to have the show the big saving was the Argon windows, the low U value windows. Um, and to some degree we were right. So you can see... Uh, here, right here, we've, we reduced the heating use by 533 MBTUs per year, which was about a 12% uh, heating reduction. But as often happens with uh, lower U-value windows, we actually increased the cooling energy by 98 MBTUs per year. And this generally happens because you know, with, with more insulative windows, uh, you're sort of creating more of a, a thermos, um, more of a greenhouse effect where at times when the inside of the building is warmer than, than the outside um, atmosphere, if, it's, if the windows are not very insulative, you can just conductively lose that heat to the outside, and that actually reduces uh, your cooling energy or your cooling requirements. Um, so we did increase the cooling energy use by about uh, 100 MBTUs, but we netted out to a savings of 387 MBTUs. So these low U-value argon windows we're still going to save us um, about 4.2% of our total energy use. So it seems like, oh, that still might make sense. We're saving 4%. Um, but then if you look over to the energy cost column, you can see that we were actually, the argon windows were actually going to cost more to operate on an annual basis. 
So this is because uh, we were saving a whole bunch of heating here, but heating is done with natural gas, which is relatively inexpensive. Cooling, on the other hand, is obviously done with electricity, which is incredibly expensive relative to natural gas. So the uh, increase in cooling from on a cost basis was actually offsetting and a little bit more uh, than the savings we were seeing from uh, heating. So we presented this to the architect who said, wait, so I'm going to put in argon-filled windows, which are a lot more expensive than traditional windows, and it's going to cost an extra $1,500 a year to operate the building. That doesn't make any sense. We're not doing that. So at the end of this study, they very happily went with uh, the pretty minimal ad cost of uh, reducing the solar heat gain coefficient, saving $30,000 a year um, from that, and not spending a whole bunch of extra money on argon-filled windows that were actually going to make it more expensive to operate the building. This is, oh, I always like this study. This is a success of energy modeling for sure. The next thing we looked at um, for this project was the HVAC systems. Uh, they, they were trying to decide exactly what kind of HVAC, HVAC system to use. So they were pretty um, intent on using water source heat pumps for a number of just space consideration reasons in the building. Uh, but they were trying to decide between traditional water source heat pumps and hybrid uh, water source heat pumps. So a hybrid water source heat pump um, works such that the cooling is done by the heat pump, but the, uh, the heating is just done with a hydronic hot water uh, coil in the terminal unit, um, which is con connected to a base building boiler. So we looked at six options for this one. Um, and on this table, we've got um, site energy, energy cost, source energy, and then percent site energy savings, percent cost savings, and percent source energy savings. And for this one, again, we have the baseline, which was just the uh, code compliant version of the building. And then these six options. So we looked at a couple of the hybrid systems and then four of the traditional water source heat pump systems. So the base, base design was to use um, this whale and hybrid system. And we looked at all these options. And the uh, best performing option of the alternatives was this Climate Master, Climate Master version, which uh, had the highest site energy and source energy savings. We actually saved about 2.5% uh, site energy with the Climate Master relative to the whale and the base of design whale and system. Um, but as you can see, despite saving 2.5% um, site energy and a little bit of source energy, we were actually losing a little bit of cost energy savings. So with the uh, whale and system, we were seeing an 8.6% 8 savings. With the Climate Master, we were down to 8.1%, so we were losing half a percent of cost savings. Um, this was an interesting study in that we got to see the, the sort of the other variables that go into the decision making here. So um, you might think that since the Wayland system was going to be cheaper to operate, they would have chosen that over the uh, traditional uh, water source heat pump climate master system. But if they'd gone with a hydro uh, hybrid system that had the hydronic heating, that would have meant they would have had to run hydronic piping throughout the entire building, uh, run hydronic piping into every single unit, and also have a massive base building boiler that would have supplied the hot water to all those systems. So that was a huge ad cost to uh, run all that piping and have that big boiler compared to just using the traditional water source heat pumps where um, it inherently has a condenser, condenser water loop that um, can be used for both heating and cooling. So you're sort of just adding an extra loop uh, to the whole building if you do the hybrid system. So seeing that they were only going to save, I think, about $6,000 per year if they used the whale in the hybrid system, um, but it was going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to put in all the hydronic piping. They said, no, this doesn't make sense. Uh, it doesn't save enough. So they, they went with the uh, Climate Master system. So again, just to uh, summarize modeling to inform the design, the whole point of it is to assess the potential operational energy savings and incremental costs of design alternatives and this lets, the, this lets the owner, the developer, the architect, the engineers choose the best energy conservation measures that save the most energy, save the most energy cost with the available uh, upfront capital that they have. So it's all about making good, informed, educated decisions instead of using rule of thumb uh, approaches. <coughs> so next I'll talk about modeling to validate the design. So again, there's really two types of uh, validation model required 
validation and elective validation. But for all types of validation modeling, they, they really work on the same premise, which is that you need to prove to somebody that your perspective building is going to use um, a certain amount of energy or a certain amount of energy less than a code compliant version of your building. Uh, so this can again be done because you're forced to or because you're pursuing some certification or incentive program in which uh, a model is how you prove your, your, what your energy use is going to be. So what you end up with the validation modeling is two models. You have your proposed case model and your baseline case model. Your proposed case model is your, a model built according to how your uh, building is actually designed. So you use your architectural drawings, your MEP drawings, MEP schedules, your landscape drawings, your HVAC narratives, your uh, architectural specs, pretty much all of the information uh, outlined in the design of, of how the building is going to be built, how the building is going to be operate. You put all of that into your proposed case model. Then you have to create your baseline case model, which you compare the proposed case to. So the baseline case model is basically a geometric replica of your proposed case model, but instead of built uh, according to all of your um, all of the architectural mechanical specs of your design, it's built according to a minimally code compliant version of your design. So instead of like uh, having wall assemblies, let's say your wall assembly at an R value of uh, 20 in your design, your R value in your baseline model would be built um, according to whatever code requires your wall R value to be. So you end up with two models. One, the baseline is just code compliant, and then you have your proposed case, which is your actual design. You then compare those two models. You either subtract your proposed case from your baseline case to just get your uh, total energy savings, or you divide your proposed case into your baseline case, and that gives you your percent energy savings. So then you have to decide what energy metric you're going to do to represent that savings. So there's a handful of energy metrics we typically use. When I say energy metric, I mean you know what unit of what unit we're using to describe energy. So the most common one and the most intuitive is site energy. So site energy is really uh, you know what your what your utility meters read. So what your what your electric meter reads, what your gas meter reads, and that's you know that's a pretty obvious one. It's just however many kilowatt hours you're pulling out of your wall when you plug something into the, the wall, or how much gas flows through uh, your gas meter on, on the way to the boiler to heat the building. We then have EUI. So EUI is energy use intensity or energy use index. Um, and again, this uses site energy, but it normalizes it on a square foot basis. So it's your uh, KBTU or 1,000 BTUs of energy per square foot. And this is a useful metric because it allows you to compare sort of uh, buildings of different sizes, but with a, a metric that makes them uh, comparable to each other. So you can compare a 20,000 square foot building to a million square foot building. If you use EUI, you can say they both have uh, an EUI of around 30. And that's, that one number can apply to both buildings in the same meaningful way. So next we have source energy. So I don't know if people are familiar with source energy, but I'll do my best to quickly explain it. It's basically the amount of energy required to create the energy that you use. So with natural gas, it's pretty much a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, you pretty much just have to, you know, it's pretty much just the added energy of pumping the gas through the uh, pipelines to get to you, but that doesn't require a lot of energy. Uh, electricity, on the other hand, it requires a lot of energy um, you have a lot of energy losses between the power plants and the transmission. So basically for every one kilowatt hour of electricity you pull out of the wall, uh, three kilowatt hours of energy were required to create that electricity for it to get to you. So that's a more meaningful metric if you want to understand the total energy uh, impact of your building, not just the energy, uh, basically the, the meter readings of your building. We then have energy cost. Um, which again is, is pretty intuitive one. That's just what your utility bills would be. So how much uh, you end up paying for your electricity every year, how much you end up paying for your natural gas every year. So owners and you know, developers tend to like this because at the end of the day, the thing they usually care most about is how much it's going to cost for them to operate their buildings. Um, so it, it has a meaningful impact for them to hear that they're going to save $30,000 if they reduce the solar heat gain coefficient. Um, of their windows. 
It also is a really good metric because it's a good proxy for source energy. The ratio of um, site to source energy is pretty similar to the, the ratio of um, uh, gas to electric cost. And then lastly, we sometimes use greenhouse gas emissions as the metric. Um, I personally like this one the most because if, if the purpose of energy efficiency is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, why not just use the metric that directly gets us to that, that end goal? Um, but unfortunately, there's no standard metric. Pretty much every different certification or, or you know, reason to use validation modeling wants you to use a different uh, energy metric. And this ends up being pretty annoying because it confuses clients to no end because if you're not an energy nerd who does this sort of thing every day and understands what and why there are those differences, uh, it can get confusing. And we'll often find ourselves at a meeting telling the client that the building's saving 28% uh, site energy, and then a couple of days later, we'll have another meeting and say it's saving 20% uh, energy cost. And they'll say, what happened to my 8%? I thought it was 28%. And we'll have to explain that there's the difference between these those metrics and why there's, why we have to use the different metrics and who requires the different metrics. And it ends up being a whole added uh, layer of confusion that would be nice to do without, but uh, I, I don't foresee it ever, ever and ever getting on the same page, really. So I'll talk now a little bit about the uh, different types of validation modeling. So the first one I'll talk about is the utility incentive program modeling. So you're all probably uh, familiar with utility incentive programs like Mass Save. Um, so Mass Save on the single family residential scale are the folks that'll uh, come to your house and blow a bunch of cellulose insulation in your attic or give you uh, Nest thermostats for 50 bucks or half price LEDs. Um, or other prescriptive uh, incentives like that. And that works great on the single family scale, but it doesn't work great on the large multifamily or uh, just commercial, commercial building scale. So the way the Mass Save program and other utility, uh, commercial utility incentive programs work is they use validation modeling, basically to see how much a prospective design, uh, how much energy a pers prospective design is gonna use less than a code compliant version of that design and then they incentivize based on the savings. So the, uh, the baseline used for, uh, for the Mass Save program is uh, an altered version of ASHRAE 90.1 2013 or IECC 2015. Uh, the other utility incentive programs I mentioned before each use a different uh, version of the code as their baseline, but in Massachusetts it's IECC 2015, ASHRAE 2013. Um, the energy metric used for this is site energy. And basically the way it works is after you've done the modeling, they say, um, okay, you've, you've saved X number of kilowatt hours per year, X number of therms per year, and they give you a dollar amount per kilowatt hour and a dollar amount per, per therm that you've saved. So the way the process generally works is um, in SDs or DDs, we uh, have what's called a design charrette where the architect, the MEP engineer, uh, the owner, representative from the utility companies, and us as the energy modelers all get together in a room. We talk about the project. We talk about uh, potential ECMs, figure out what ECMs would make sense for the project to potentially pursue. Then we agree on that, and we go back as the energy modelers and create a DD-level energy model with the uh, ECMs we've, we've talked about including in the project. So we, we create that, uh, we then submit that to the utility companies, the Mass Save uh, folks. They review it and basically come up with a projected incentive amount that they will pay for um, all the ECMs that you've included. They then submit that to the uh, owner, to the architect, who can then use those prospective incentive money, use that prospective incentive money while they're doing their payback analysis and uh, trying to figure out what ECMs to include in the design. So once they've done that, uh, figured out what ECMs they're going to include, they've worked on the, uh, gone through the CD process, come up with 100% CDs, they then send those back to us and we create a final model that, uh, based on 100% CDs, includes all the finalized ECMs. We then you know, finish that model, write a report, and submit that to the Mass Save utility uh, company folks, review it, make sure everything looks good to them. Uh, then the last step of the process is after the building is completed, they send an inspector in to basically make sure that 
all the ECMs that were in the design and in the model were actually uh, included in the building and are installed and functioning the way that uh, the design said they would and the way the model said they would. And assuming they are, they then uh, distribute the incentive money to the team. So for the RESI project in Boston, we looked at about nine different ECMs. So we looked at um, improved windows, the solar heat gain thing I talked about earlier, uh, reduced lighting power density, uh, better ERVs on the RTUs, condensing boilers, the uh, high efficiency water source heat pumps we talked about earlier, uh, high efficiency heat rejection, reduced uh, lighting power density in the parking garage, and some high efficiency domestic hot water heaters and low flow fixtures. So as you can see here, when uh, we sum all of those measures up, we ended up saving about 560,000 kilowatt hours per year and about uh, 19,000 therms per year. So uh, the building's currently under construction, but assuming everything gets installed the way it was designed and modeled, uh, this team will be in for a pretty penny when the inspector signs off on everything. So the next type of validation modeling I'll talk about is uh, modeling for lead purposes. So I assume most people have heard of LEED. Uh, in case you're not too familiar with it, I'll quickly try to describe it. So LEED is a green building certification uh, program. It works on a point scale where there's, I think, around 120 points or so. And you can, you can accrue points for, uh, for nine different uh, credit categories, ranging from location and transportation to materials to indoor air quality, uh, innovation, water efficiency and then energy and atmosphere. So within the energy and atmosphere category, there's a handful of credits uh, that deal with on-site renewable production, green power, a few other things, but the uh, meat and potatoes of it is the energy model. And again, the energy model uh, is proving how much energy your prospective design uses relative to a code compliant baseline. So you can, as you can see from this table, uh, if you, if you achieve a 50% savings, you get 18 uh, points towards your certification. As you can see here, the minimum point required for certification is 40. So the energy model alone can get you almost halfway um, to this 40 points for certification. So this is always, or this is by far the biggest point source in LEED and usually one of the most difficult but most important uh, credits for LEED certification. So a little more detail about the uh, about modeling for lead. So uh, I'll be specific. This is from uh, lead version four. So at the moment, there's uh, still many projects pursuing lead version three, a lot pursuing lead version four, and now uh, projects are starting to pursue lead version 4.1, which just came out a few weeks ago. So for version four, uh, the baseline code that you use for the baseline is ASHRAE 90.1 2010. The savings metric you use is energy cost savings. And um, so the model, the model actually doubles as both the uh, means to meet the prerequ prerequisite for energy use, and then also uh, <coughs> doubles as the means to pursue the actual credit. So the prerequisite requires that you show a 5% energy cost savings relative to the uh, 90.1 2010 baseline. Then for every percent savings after 5%, um, you start to gain points. So for 6% energy cost savings, you get uh, one point. And then basically for every 2% savings you show after that, you get an additional point. All the way up to 50% uh, savings gets you 18 points. So the lead process isn't really that interesting. It's, it's just normal validation modeling um, where you have your proposed case and your baseline case. You compare them see how much you're saving and get some amount of points for that. But for the uh, RESI project in Boston, the interesting thing we did was it was the first project where we pursued um, an alternative comp compliance path for the energy metric. So as I said before, the energy metric for LEED is typically energy cost. But LEED came out with what they call a, um, the alternative energy performance metric, ACP, about a year, year and a half ago that allowed you to substitute energy cost as the metric with an average of source energy and greenhouse gas uh, emissions savings. So 
it really is a much better metric. It provides more meaningful environmental metric. Um, it also lets you take credit for the relative cleanliness of your local grid. So grids all around the country are very different. Uh, Massachusetts happens to have a very clean grid. So uh, for projects in Massachusetts, it just sort of makes sense to pursue this ACP. One, because you get to show more savings. But two, because you actually often uh, find teams making decisions knowing that we have a very clean grid and it makes more sense to use electricity here than it does in, say, Wyoming or, or Mississippi. You'll see why I'm picking on them uh, in a minute. So fortunately, LEED provides you this calculator that sort of runs you through this process of pursuing this ACP. Uh, basically, the way, the way the calculator works is you run your proposed case, your baseline models, uh, you then input your annual operational energy use, so your total kilowatt hours, your total therms. So you input um, those for both your baseline and your proposed. Then you have to go out and, depending on where your project is located, you have to use this, um, this table provided by your Energy Star Portfolio Manager, which has the greenhouse gas emission factors. So these are the uh, kilograms per million BTUs or kilograms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions per million BTUs of energy use. So for gas, that's pretty much the same no matter where you are, because gas in Massachusetts is pretty much the same as gas in Wyoming, California, anywhere. Uh, it burns it however it burns and emits, emits carbon uh, CO2 emissions. Electricity, on the other hand, it's very different depending on where you are. Um, so that's what this table is showing. So in Massachusetts or New England, um, our greenhouse gas emission factor is about 75. So the national average greenhouse gas emission factor for electricity is 133. And then you can even see in uh, Mississippi, it's 215. And Wyoming, wherever that is, also is also in the 200 range. And this is generally because they burn a lot of coal in those grids. So the more coal in your grid, typically uh, the far, far worse your greenhouse gas emission factor is going to be. So then you do a similar thing for source energy. Um, uh, again, natural gas doesn't really, the, the source energy for natural gas is pretty much the same as the site energy. So you end up with a slightly different, uh, you've got a 1.05% or 1.05 factor for gas. Um, but for electricity, you have that 3.14 uh, factor, which is basically saying for every one unit of electricity that you use in your building, 3.14 units of energy um, had to be used to create that. Actually, I will note that that number has changed recently. So when we did this project about six months ago, it was 3.14. When I, when I made this slide, sure enough, it was 2.8. So something worth noting, because that 3.14 number has been used forever. Um, so something changed. So the last bit of that calculator um, is a just something that averages those two numbers. So are those two units of savings. You can see when we uh, put in those factors in this column for source energy for greenhouse gas emissions, basically it just multiplied that factor by the uh, electric use and gas use, gave us our total greenhouse gas emissions for our baseline and total for our proposed. Uh, we then divided that into that and saw that, okay, we're saving 21.4% um, greenhouse gas emissions relative to a code compliant baseline. Source energy did the same process and showed that we're saving 13.7% uh, source energy relative to the code compliant baseline. And that gives us an average of 17.5% um, total savings. We then plug that no, uh, number into the normal lead table to figure out how many points you get. So we were just over the 16% threshold. So this project got six points um, for their lead energy model. So the last bit of validation, model, validation modeling I'll talk about is code compliance modeling. Um, so this process works the same as all the other validation modeling. You have your proposed case model built uh, according to your actual design and your baseline model built according to whatever the code in question is. So in Massachusetts, um, that code is IECC 2015 ASHRAE, or ASHRAE 90.1 2013. Oh, that's going to change, I think, in July to the next uh, version of those codes. So 
the reason you use a model for code compliance would be that for one reason or another, your project can't use the prescriptive compliance path. So in order to use the prescriptive compliance path, every uh, component of your building has to meet the prescriptive requirements. So that would be your wall assemblies have to meet the prescriptive wall requirements. Your roof has to meet the prescriptive roof requirements. All your HVAC equipment has to be as efficient as the code requires. So every individual piece has to be in prescriptive compliance. If one of those items is not in prescriptive compliance, let's say you, for whatever reason, wanted to use inefficient chillers, or more likely, for one reason or another, your wall assembly couldn't quite meet the uh, wall assembly requirement, or uh, most often case we see is uh, the code requires a maximum of 40% window to wall ratio. And most office buildings and residential buildings we see uh, built these days have higher than 40% window to wall ratio. So if that's the case, you can no longer use prescriptive uh, compliance. So you have to use an energy model. So with code compliance, you just have to show that your building uses the same amount or less energy than a code compliant version of your building. Um, and the metric used for, for code compliance is site energy. So just it has to use the same amount or just a hair less than the uh, code compliant version in order to be in uh, compliance with the code. However, uh, Massachusetts also has something called the stretch code. So this, this is an elective, um, sort of an elective code that individual towns can choose whether or not they want to make part of their building code. And if they do, uh, they become what's known as a stretch code community. And that means that for any building that's greater than 100,000 square feet, uh, your proposed, your, your design has to use at least 10% less energy than a code compliant version of your building. So as it turns out, Boston is a stretch code community. So this project, uh, this residency project, has to use at least 10% less energy, uh, less site energy than a uh, code compliant version. Fortunately, that was no problem for them. For them, they were easily uh, easily met it, being almost 20% better than code. So just to summarize, um, for this project, all the types of energy modeling that we did. We early in the design in SDDD and CDs, uh, did design assistance modeling where we looked at about 15 different sets of energy conservation measures, a couple of which I talked about. Um, then we sort of sent all that information to the architect, the owner, the engineers. They decided which ECMs they wanted to pursue and incorporate into the project. Um, once they did that, uh, they gave us the final 100% CD set. We created a final model that reflected the actual 100% CD design. And we then compared that model to a lead baseline model, which used ASHRAE 90.1-2010 as the baseline, utility incentive uh, baseline, which used ASHRAE 90.1-2013 with the alterations that MassSave makes you make, and then lastly, a uh, code compliance baseline, which was ASHRAE 90.1-2013. So that was uh, energy modeling in a nutshell. Uh, the last 10 minutes here, I'll talk a little bit about daylight analysis. So daylight analysis is a whole separate type of analysis. Um, the results of it often play into an energy model, and the, the two of them sort of uh, work off of each other, but this is typically done in different software uh, and for a different purpose. It's not so much about operational energy savings, although the results of it can let you sort of change the way you... It can change how much artificial light you have to use, which can result in energy savings, but... Really, the purpose of it is to uh, create better spaces that are more naturally lit and more enjoyable to be in. So there's two types of daylight analysis, illuminance studies and spatial daylight autonomy. So illuminance studies have been around for a long time. Uh, it's the way this has sort of typically been done. These are point-in-time analyses, analyses. So uh, you basically pick a specific moment on a specific day, and you say how much light is there going to be uh, in the building at that exact moment on that exact day given a specified sky condition. So you can pick it's going to be a cloudy day, a sunny day, um, and pick your exact time of day. So typically this is done at 9 a.m., uh, noon, and 3 p.m. on the solstices and the equinox. And the idea being those are sort of uh, good representative dates and times. You can then sort of interpolate between those dates and times and figure out approximately 
if the building was performing a certain way on those dates, it'll likely perform in a similar way on uh, dates and times between them. But there's lots of problems with that. It's really not a good way to uh, inform. It's not a good means of informing the design. And uh, I'd be hard pressed to recommend making decisions based on an aluminum study. But fortunately, in the last few years, an alternative way of dealing, doing daylight analysis has come out called spatial daylight autonomy. So the way this works is um, it runs an analysis of uh, every hour of the year that, in which there's sunlight, um, and it uses your TMY weather file, which is the weather, fi or the weather file that's used for uh, other energy modeling. Uh, and two of, the, two of the variables in a TMY weather file are direct and diffuse daylight. So this weather file actually knows that you know, here on the UMass campus, um, the likelihood of there being direct sunlight hitting this room right now or the likelihood of there being uh, diffuse sunlight hitting this room right now. So it basically lets you, for every hour of the year, run an analysis that reflects the actual uh, climate you're in, the actual amount of daylight that you'd be experiencing. And the way uh, spatial daylight autonomy or SD analysis works is it looks at the percent of occupied hours that there's adequate daylight, which is usually classified as at least 300 lux, such that artificial light is not needed. So what percent of the time uh, during occupied hours is there enough daylight that we wouldn't have to turn the lights on? The second part of this analysis, which is sort of built into it, is uh, something called ASE analysis or um, annual sunlight exposure analysis. And that basically looks at, in those same spaces, what percent of occupied hours are there greater than 1,000 lux? And when there's uh, more than 1,000 lux, the idea is that's going to cause glare issues and it's going to be an uncomfortable place to be in. So pretty much you want, uh, you want to be in a space that somewhere, has somewhere between 300 lux and 1,000 lux of daylight. So this image here is an office building in Boston that I'm currently working on where we're doing uh, spatial daylight autonomy. So much like energy, uh, whole building energy simulation, daylight models are done to inform the design and also done to validate the design. So when we're doing it to inform the design, we're basically studying daylight opportunities, seeing if we can improve them, have more daylight in the spaces, but we're also looking to mitigate glare issues. Um, for validating design, we're typically just looking at lead um, the CHIPS program, Collaborative for High Performance School. Schools also has a daylighting credit. Uh, so validation is really just if you're pursuing some certification and one of the credits in that certification uh, is daylighting. So for the, uh, this office building that I'm working on, the main reason they hired us was uh, it's this big, new, beautiful office building. And part of the design was this um, a lobby and cafe in this bottom floor area right here. So they wanted to have like an enjoyable, inviting place where people would <laughs> hang out. But this entire facade, um, um, I can't see the laser, there we go. This entire facade here, directly adjacent to the lobby cafe space, uh, was 100% glazed. So there's a beautiful view outside of this facade. So they wanted 100% glazed views to the outside. Then they were worried with all that glazing, we're just going to cook everyone who's sitting in the, um, in the lobby cafe space. It's going to be uncomfortable. No one's going to be in there. So we really want to have the views, but we really want to have it be an enjoyable place. So let's, let's do some daylight analysis and figure out how we can make both of those things a reality. So the, um, this is actually a project I'm working on now. Uh, so we've only looked at uh, three options to date. So we have the original design, which is just the design as, it, as it's drawn up today. And then I've looked at uh, two options, one with a reduced uh, visible light transmittance on all the windows, and one where I've looked at uh, shading fins on all the windows. And again, with the idea being that we want to keep the views, but reduce the glare, direct sunlight um, in this lobby cafe space here. <laughs> So this is what the uh, SDA analysis looks like. So you end up with this heat map that shows uh, the percent of occupied hours above 300 lux. So we've got the scale here all the way on the right. And basically what that's showing is that any space that's in black, 0% uh, of occupied hours is their adequate daylight. Anything that's that dark blue, 20% of occupied hours, there's adequate daylight. 
it's green, 60% of hours of adequate daylight, and anything red, 100% of hours of adequate daylight. So we've got uh, all the way on the left here, the original design, got the low VLT option in the middle, and the shading fin option on the right. As you can see, there's pretty much adequate daylight in almost all the spaces, um, around 60, 50, 60, 70% of the time in all of these options. Um, there's really good daylighting opportunities everywhere. That was never really the concern of the project. They knew there'd be a lot of daylight because there's so much glass. The concern was really glare. Um, actually, yeah, one note about this, you'll see there's these black areas. So these are mechanical rooms, storage spaces, bathrooms, other non-regularly occupied spaces where daylighting would be of no real value. So those are excluded from the analysis. Um, as you can see, even with low VLT and shading fins, there's still really adequate daylight in this um, lobby cafe area, so they didn't inf interfere too much. Then we come to the uh, glare analysis. So again, we've got this scale all the way on the right here, and it works in a similar way such that uh, anything that's in black, 0% of occupied hours or above 1,000 lux. Anything in blue, 20% of the time, there's too much light, it's gonna be uncomfortable. 60, or anything in green, 60% of the time, too much light, it's gonna be uncomfortable. Anything in red, uh, it's always going to be too much light and uncomfortable. So again, we have the original design on the left here, OVLT in the middle, and shading fins on the right. So here you can actually see that the, uh, the design alternatives made a pretty big impact when it came to glare. So this is the lobby cafe area right here. And as the, the way the building's currently designed, um, it's going to be uncomfortably bright between, say, 50, 60, 70% of the time here. So that's not gonna be, that's not gonna be an enjoyable cafe to sit in. Low VLT option, that same space, we're more in the uh, 30, 40, 50, 60% of the time there's too much light. But then we look at the shading fin option and we've managed to drop it to pretty much 20% of the time um, there's gonna be uh, too much light and it's gonna be uncomfortable. This actually makes a pretty, just adding these shading fins makes a pretty big difference for how much direct uh, uncomfortable light there is in this area. So again, this is a project I'm currently working on and I'm sure I'm gonna do a dozen or so more uh, variations of VLTs or shading fins, or probably some combination of those two. Uh, I think that the goal is to try to get the amount of uh, percent of time above 1,000 lux to be in the 10% or so range. Um, so we'll, we'll figure out some combination of options that gets us there. So lastly, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the daylighting credit for uh, LEED. So there's, uh, there's three ways to achieve the daylight credit. There's the SDA analysis, uh, which is what we're going to do. The illuminance option, which is what I talked about before, uh, which isn't a great way to do it. And then lastly, you can actually do an on-site measurement option. So that would be after the building is completely built. Someone can go there with a light meter and just pace around the building, uh, taking uh, light readings every like, two feet or so. Uh, there's a number of problems with that option. We've only, we've only done that once, I think. Um, so we usually, we usually try to stay away from that. So we pretty much always do the SDA option for uh, lead daylighting. Yeah, one other note about this, as I mentioned before, for daylighting, you don't have to include uh, storage spaces, mechanical rooms, corridors, uh, places that aren't considered regularly occupied. You're only concerned about places where people are going to be uh, sitting continuously for at least an hour. And the last little note about uh, daylighting for lead, in case anyone's ever tried to pursue the uh, lead daylighting credit and vowed never to do it again because it was almost impossible, uh, in LEED 4.1, which I mentioned just came out a few weeks ago, we sort of revamped the credit to make it uh, much more practical, much more achievable. Um, so if you if you vowed never to do it again, I'd encourage you to look at it, look at the uh, V4.1 criteria and, and think about doing it. Uh, so just a little more information about daylighting for LEED. If you're doing the SDA approach, which is what we'll do, um, the way it works is uh, they do what's called SDA 350. So you have to be at uh, 300 lux for at least 50% of time, 50% of the time to be in compliance. So if 40% of your regularly occupied square footage 
has more than 300 lux for more than 50% of the time, then you get one point. 55% uh, of your space is within those parameters, you get two points. And if 75% of your space meeting the requirements, you get three points. Uh, the one other requirement in LEED 4.1 is if over 10% of your regularly occupied spaces have greater than 1,000 lux, and again, are going to have glare issues as a, as a result of that. Um, yeah, so if, uh, if you're over 10% of your spaces have more than 1,000 lux for more than 250 hours per year, you have to basically just provide a narrative saying how the project is going to uh, address the glare issues. And that's actually the biggest difference between LEED 4.1 and LEED uh, version four. In version four, if you had more than a thousand lux for 10% uh, of your spaces for more than 250 hours, you just could no longer achieve the credit. That meant you weren't in compliance. Now you just have to write a narrative saying we're going to pull down the blinds or do whatever you're going to do to address glare. Um, so that makes it a lot more achievable. That's what for every project we tried to do the daylight and credit on. That was the snag that we always ran into and immediately realized we weren't going to be able to meet the credit. So that's daylighting. All right, well, Peter, the coveted BCT water oh, bottle is not yours. All right.